Old and the New Testament, here are some examples. During the rule of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaton came an important religious change. Pharaoh Akhenaton was a very important pharaoh. He single-handedly changed the worship in Egypt from the worship of many gods to the worship of just one god in particular and to the exclusion of all other gods. The name of this god was Re. Pharaoh Akhenaton established that from now on there is only one god. This single eye was the symbol of Amen Re. And the eye was always within the circle, the sun, the eye of God. There are at least three different places in the Bible where Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. For instance, in Ephesians 2.20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, this is very important. Ask any architect or anyone who knows anything about the terminology of architecture, ask them, where do you find a chief cornerstone? Now, you can find an ordinary cornerstone at the top of a building or at the bottom. But where do you find a chief cornerstone? A chief cornerstone is translated from the Greek word meaning the peak of a pyramid or the capstone. Why the peak of a pyramid, you may ask? All you have to do is look at the back of an American dollar bill where you will find a pyramid with the chief cornerstone separated from the pyramid. But what is perhaps even more American dollar bill within the separated cornerstone is the eye of Horus, the all-seeing eye of Iusus, the Son of God, the eye of Ray, that we pray to and say, Amen. In Isaiah 19.19, God says to his people, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. In other words, in the middle of Egypt, there will be an altar to the Lord. Well, in the very middle of Egypt stands Cheops, the Great Pyramid exactly in the middle. Amazing? Yes. But even more so when you consider that it had already been sitting there for 3,000 years before the Bible was written. In John 10:11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life to the sheep. In John 10:14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. In the book of Hebrews 13:20, in the book of Revelation 12:5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And in Revelation 19.15, and he shall rule the nation with a rod of iron. Well, we've now established that Jesus is the good shepherd who shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. The Pharaoh was referred to as the good shepherd. The people, the royal household and the religious household of Egypt were called an Egyptian the shepherd's fold. Pharaoh, being the representative of Iusus, the son of God, was called the great shepherd, who looked after the shepherd's fold. The Pharaoh was considered to be the incarnation of Amen Re, who ruled for God on earth. And that is where we get the idea that there would be an earthly kingdom. And the Pharaoh was the king of the kingdom. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. The Lamb now you talk about an old concept and an old motif that certainly is virtually all the ancient religions in the world had a lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world as a matter of fact the the uh, Buddhists today a very ancient ancient priesthood far far in excess of, of uh, Christianity existed in the Himalaya mountains where the Buddhists have a religious leader called the Dalai Lama. Dalai comes from the word, Latin word meaning God. Dai, Dalai, God, Lama. A Lama is like a lamb. A Lama is a lamb. Therefore the word Dalai Lama is God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world. It's a very old and widespread concept. God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world existed far before the Hebrews. Interesting, wasn't it? Amun Ray. Right. Africa oh. being a desert waited for the monsoon rains to come to Central Africa, the highlands. And 
Of course, when the rains came, they would overflow the tributaries flowing northward, which would be downhill into the deserts of North Africa, and the waters would eventually overflood the Nile, so that once a year the Nile Delta would become flooded. And that was a great and terrible tragedy each year. The great flood that came and washed away the Egyptians' world. The, they, were, they called the waters the waters of chaos. But the waters were chaotic and they just went everywhere. And while the waters of chaos were ter terrible and destructive, they also brought new life. Because without the waters of chaos coming, the desert, nothing would grow. So they realized that the waters of chaos were a blessing, in fact, that brought new life. So each, each year, when the waters of the flood would recede, leaving, of course, the fresh minerals and nutrients in the waters, which would then cause the food to grow, and spring would be a beautiful time in Egypt because of the waters of chaos, they celebrated the coming of the waters of chaos, bringing the new life. They call that celebration in Egypt the Arca Noah. Not the Ark of Noah, but Arca Noah. The Arca Noah celebration was the coming of the great flood that washed away the old world and brought new life, and therefore Egypt was born again. And of course, at this particular time of the month, you must, be, you must be born again. You are baptized. It's actually a very ancient motif. All that we find in Judaism and Christianity, there is virtually not one concept, belief, or idea expressed in Judaism or Christianity. Not one. That cannot be traced back many, many times to many different religions, it's a very old, ancient story. It's the greatest story ever told. To show how ancient Egypt and